Is this on? Yes. Um, reminding you once again to please fill out your yellow cards. Not only does that enable us to track our attendance, but it also helps us keep uh, um, a record of prayer requests that you might have so that we might take them with us on Wednesday night to our prayer meetings. That is uh, 6 p.m. every Wednesday night. Love to see you there. It's always a great time in the Lord. Please sign up for uh, Connect Cafe. There's a, a sign-up sheet in the back, and um, if you'd like to help with that, feel free to, to sign up. We will be joining River's Edge Community Services in collecting good used and new toys for Christmas starting today. Um, there's a blue box back there, same blue box that's always been back there, but it has a new sign so uh, to let you know what we're looking for and I invite you to take the time to read it, and then perhaps if you're able, to donate something. Um, another opportunity for uh, ministry and mission is we will be having a Harvest Home Offering on October 30th. There's a table in the back with some food items on it. It's centered around Thanksgiving. So if you are, again, um, if you have the resources and are um, willing to help, take a look at what's needed and We'd love to have you join us. We're going to collect all of that on October 30th and then dedicate it, and then after that, uh, deliver it to uh, Community Reach in Red Lion. Youth Fellowship will meet this evening at 6 p.m. and we'll start at Zion House, as always, and then come over here. Bible Adventure meets on Wednesday with listeners coming at 1.30 and children at 2. Um, adopt a Highway, excuse me, Missed one. Uh, worship committee will meet on Thursday, October 20th at 7 p.m. Thursday, October 20th at 7 p.m. Adopt a Highway cleanup is on October 22nd. That's a Saturday. Uh, we will be meeting at the church at 8 a.m., correct? And it's this coming Saturday, 8 a.m. United Methodist Women will meet on Tuesday, October 25th at 6 p.m. We normally meet at 7. However, we're having a special gathering with a meal. And uh, we really invite all the women of the church to come and join us for that. The Visitation Committee will meet on Thursday, October 27th at 10 a.m. Trunk or Treat will be on Saturday, October 29th at 5 p.m. That's over here in the parking lot. First time ever was last year and I had a blast. So please come on out and, and get your goodies and vote for the best vehicle. Are there any other announcements that need to be mentioned? Let's repair our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the opening voluntary.
Thank you, Elaine. Would you stand for the call to worship? The words are printed in, uh, on the screen before you. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day long. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your decrees are my meditation. Let us worship God by turning to number 600, Wonderful Words of Life. Number 600, the words are also on the screen before you. Sing them over again to me, Wonderful Words of Life. Let Righteous one of all generations, how glorious is your name. You speak and the worlds are created. You establish the boundaries of the seas and the land. Your countenance illumines the heavens above us. Your righteousness is known throughout all the earth. We live by your mercy and depend on your blessings. We give you all praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 119. We'll be reading verses 97 to 104. The words are printed on the screen before you. Would you join with me by reading the bold uh, type, and I'll read the regular type. Oh, how I love your law. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is always with me. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I do not turn away from your ordinance, for you have taught me. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Amen. Our act of praise is great as thy faithfulness, number 140. Let us sing together. You may remain seated as we sing.
Amen. Our scripture lesson for this morning comes from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. Luke and the 18th chapter, beginning with verse 1. I invite you to listen to the word of the Lord. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice, that she won't eventually wear me out with her uh, coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen.
Let us pray. And now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I want you to consider a list that I'm going to read to you in just a few seconds here. And, and think about, maybe you've ever heard these uh, phrases before, or maybe you've even said them yourself. God is too busy keeping the universe in order. He didn't want to hear about my little problems. God would think that I'm selfish if I pray for my own needs. If I really love him, I'll put myself last. I know that the cattle on a thousand hills belong to God, but that is just a figure of speech, a, a song, really. He's not in the business of taking care of me, and I won't ask him to do it. This next one's probably the most used one. I've done too many bad things in my life. I'm not good enough. I can't tell you how many people have come into my office with a serious crisis and said something just like that. Especially that last one. I'm not good enough. The problem is that every one of those statements is a lie straight from hell. Because they come from a, a, a totally wrong place. That last one especially. Because it almost sounds true, doesn't it? Because we are not good enough. There's no one in this room that can buy their salvation. You can't do it. You're not good enough. But God's grace covers that. And Jesus tells a story in Luke chapter 18 that sort of makes this point. In a certain town, there was a widow that had been a victim of some injustice. We're not sure what it was, but it was an injustice committed against a woman who had lost her husband. And, and let me tell you this, that it was no surprise to the people who were listening to Jesus to hear that the woman had been treated unfairly in any part of the country. You see, at that time, a woman was considered property of first her husband, I mean, excuse, excuse me, first her father, and then if she got married, then she was the property of her husband. While this arrangement was indeed oppressive, it was the only way in that society for a woman to get ahead. Well, really not to get ahead, just to simply survive. Once the woman became a widow, she had no one to look after her, no one to care for her. Consequently, it was not uncommon for widows to be victimized. This particular widow would find herself in court, not once or twice, but over and over and over and over and over and over again. The problem was that the judge to whom she was pleading her case was himself a product of that oppressive society and refused to grant the widow justice. This, of course, caused the widow to be further victimized. The twist of the story and the part that would have surprised the listeners came as a result of the continual appeal of the widow to the judge. Jesus said in verse 4 and 5, For some time the judge refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out. We have a hard time understanding why a judge would be so mean, especially to a woman who had been cruelly mistreated, not only by the death of her husband, not only by society, but also by this unknown and unnamed assailant. <clears throat> After all, widows in our time, while struggling with the loss of a spouse, can and very often do very well. Women in general, in our time, whether widows or not, can be formidable. We're further 
surprised as we discover that Scripture seems to support the behavior of the unjust judge. Consider the instruction in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. As in all the churches of the saints, women should be silent in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law also says. If there's anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. This is echoed in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. Hear that, Wanda? I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Hear that, Wanda? She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, and Eve and Adam, and, and then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. Not entirely true, is it? But the woman was deceived and became a transgressor, yet she will be saved through childbearing. Isn't that interesting? Provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. As just a kind of aside here this morning, how many women here really want to punch the Apostle Paul right in the face? Go ahead, you can raise your hand. God isn't going to kill you. Yeah. Take heart, the Apostle Paul would also write in Galatians chapter 2, verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You see, we, get, we can get caught up in these passages, like the first two that I read to you, to our peril, and many do. John Wesley said that the Bible contained everything necessary for our salvation, uh, but it contained a lot of cultural information that was unique to the Bible times, unnecessary for salvation. The instructions that Paul gave in these two instances have nothing to do with salvation or the workings of the church today. They simply make the point that we live in a different time. Now, we need to be careful here. That can be a slippery slope. For example, if, if that was cultural, maybe some of the moral underpinnings in the Bible are cultural. So they, they may not apply today. That is not true at all. We need to be careful when we read Scripture and to understand that there was a context. Most of the letters that Paul wrote, in fact, all of them except Romans, were written to put out some kind of fire in the church. And in those two cases, there were women who were causing chaos in the church because they just weren't educated. And, and you know, we don't have that today. Okay, so Paul said in, in order to keep... And to keep order, just keep them quiet. Talk to them at home. And so we begin to get a sense of how this poor widow must have felt. She was a woman utterly without power. Someone we do not know who was causing her pain. Perhaps he, and it had to be a he, perhaps he was trying to take away what little property she had inherited from her late husband. Perhaps this widow had done him some kind of service, some mending or washing perhaps, and the assailant was withholding pay, money, by the way, that could mean the difference between eating and starving to death. Whatever the case, the widow was being exploited, and so she took her case to court. The only problem as I have already said, the judge she was assigned, uh, assigned had been brought up in society's treatment of, of, of women. And so he wouldn't listen. Yet because the woman kept nagging, that's such a man thing, isn't it? Such a man word, nagging. Kept pestering. Would not relent. The judge gave in. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. Now this is where this passage gets a little dicey for me. There are a lot of people who will look at this passage of Scripture and say that it is an allegory. That is to say that every major element in the story has a corresponding and equal element in real life. 
Hence, we have another list. The judge represents God. And as the judge would not listen at first, neither will God. The widow represents us, and as she was persistent, so must we be persistent. The judge was worn down by this persistence, and so will God. So let's stay persistent in our prayers, for that is the key to unlocking God's well-hidden blessing. This, however, is not the lesson Jesus was trying to teach. Just like the list at the beginning of this morning's message, this list, too, is a lie straight from hell. The story Jesus told in Luke chapter 18 is not an allegory. It is a parable intended to compare and contrast, and that makes all the difference. In that light, the list becomes this. The earthly judge was a scoundrel. God loves us with an everlasting and unconditional love. The earthly judge did not want to give the widow any justice. God, on the other hand, wants to give us every good and perfect gift. We know that straight out of James chapter 1. The widow had to persist because the earthly judge would not listen at first. We persist not to get God's attention, not to chip away at his rough exterior, but because we love God and we love to talk to God. The earthly judge gave in to get rid of the widow. God answers prayer because he wants to give his children what they need. God wants to spend time with his children. In his book, Too Busy Not to Pray, Bill Hybels wrote, The Bible teaches that we serve a God who is simply looking for opportunities to pour out his blessings on us. It's as if he were saying, what good are my resources if I don't have anyone to share them with? Just give me a reasonable amount of cooperation and I will pour out my blessings on you. Just listen to the passage of the Bible, that uh, some of the passages of the Bible that bear this out. Leviticus chapter 26. If you follow my statutes and keep my commandments and observe them faithfully, I will give you your rains in their season and the land shall yield its produce. And the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall overtake the vintage. And the vintage shall overtake the sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full and live securely in your land. And I will grant peace in the land and you shall lie down and no one shall make you afraid. I will remove dangerous animals from the land and no sword shall go through your land. Deuteronomy chapter 28, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall you be, excuse me, blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your livestock, both the increase of your cattle and the issue of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will open for you his rich storehouse, the heavens, to give the rain of your land in its season, and to bless all your undertakings. You will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. Ephesians chapter 1. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. Galatians chapter 4, so you are no longer a slave, but a child, and if a child, also an heir through God. Romans 8, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. What a fantastic promise. God will cover us with blessing because he has adopted us as his daughters and sons. As God's children and legal heirs, we own the world and the universe. Should we ever fear to tell our Father our needs? The answer, my friends, is no. We should not fear. Because God has called us 
into his presence. The song says, I know who stands before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The psalmist says he is before us and behind us. He's to the right and to the left. He is all around us, above and below. Paul says there's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ, uh, love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The question before us this morning is this. What will we do? Will we continue in our hopelessness and our loneliness? much like the widow of the first century? Or will we claim our new identity as children of God? My prayer is that we will choose the latter. My prayer is that we will know who we are and to whom we belong. My prayer is that we will realize with great joy that God actually calls us into his presence. Amen and amen. Our hymn is number 526. What a friend we have in Jesus. The words are on the screen before you. I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing together. Number 526. Let us affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. What are your joys and your concerns this morning as we gather for prayer? Carl Young? Carol. Carol. Carol Young. Mm -hmm. Somebody over here? Cheryl Mund. M U N N. I'm sorry. David Wilson. David Wilson. Scott Eisenhower. Amen. Sorry, Dave. Just Ben. No, we're grateful to see you all. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Amen. The Cover family. Amen. Please keep my niece Katie in your prayers and also my daughter-in-law Alicia. Alicia is doing pretty good, but she still has a ways to go. Let's spend some time in silent prayer this morning. We know who goes before us. We know who stands behind. You are the God of angel armies, and you are always by our side. We're grateful this morning to be able to call you Father, to know that we are joint heirs with Jesus, that we are one family in Christ. Thank you for allowing us to be here with friends we haven't seen for a while due to whatever, illness, other issues, and those we see every week. We're grateful, Lord God, that on this beautiful day that you have gathered us together to celebrate the fact that you are so creative, as evident with the, the leaves around us, that you are ever providing for our needs, as evidenced uh, by the fact that we have a place to live and food to eat that you have saved us as evident of our assurance of faith this day. We are grateful, Lord God, that you have indeed called us to this place. To be sure, as we have already heard this morning, we don't deserve this. We're, we've not, we're not good enough. Because we have sinned and we have fallen short of your glory. But in that confession, Lord God, we have faith to know that you hear us, that you do not turn your back away or to us. You do not, Lord God, leave us to our own devices, but instead have come, have died on the cross, risen to life again. The fact that you broke your body and shed your blood 
has given us the opportunity by faith to accept salvation, to surrender our lives to you, and to know that you forgive our sins, and that while we are not good enough, you are. And we stand not on our own merits, but on yours. As we stand on the merits, Lord, of of Jesus uh, this morning, we want to remember these persons in our prayers. Carol Young, Cheryl Munn, David Wilson, Scott Eisenhower, the Cover family, Katie, Alicia. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to lift them up in prayer. Thank you for the assurance that you hear us. Thank you, Lord God, uh, for convincing us this day that you are even now working to meet whatever these needs are. And needs that have, been, have not been shared, Lord, it needs that we don't even know about. You are aware. And you are working. And we give you praise. Thank you for hearing us even as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite the ushers to come as we worship through our tithes and offerings. Please remember to put your yellow cards in the offering plate. And as we sing together. Father, we thank you for this day that you have made. We thank you for this opportunity to come into your house and worship you with this family of believers. We lift these tithes, gifts, and offerings up before you. Ask your blessing upon them and upon the givers, and that they may be used for your purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our sending hymn is number 405. Seek ye first. The words are also on the screen. Let us sing together.
Once again, our benediction comes from the Scriptures. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 and 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.